Hey everyone, how's it going? And welcome back to Citywide Blackout, your home for the best creators from around the world. I'm your host, Max Bowen. And my next guest is very well known for her many books, workshops, and presentations on writing. Whether it's Get a Grip on Your Grammar or the Novel Editing Workbook, she knows everything there is to know about the, the writing process. And now she's taking that in a new direction with her debut fiction novel, The Baba Yaga Mask, recently released both in print and audio. Chris Spizak joins me. Chris, uh, welcome to the show. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much, Max. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So I want to start by by just kind of asking the obvious question. What happened that you said, okay, I'm going to shift gears here and go from novel writing workbooks to uh, actually writing a novel? Well, the funny thing is my entire, I would say professional career, but I'll go with life. My entire life, fiction has been my love. Fiction has been my passion. And as much as the writers who are listening might absolutely hate this story, I've always been a novelist and I stumbled accidentally into my first three books, which are nonfiction. Um, I have always been a fiction editor professionally, working with people empowering their storytelling while I've been working on my own on the side. And during this pursuit, I had started a blog back in 2012, just about the subtleties of language, because even when English is our first language, sometimes there's so many things that we don't realize. The difference between further and further, the difference between, I don't know, disinterested and uninterested, all of these little subtleties that I have been obsessed with my whole life that I didn't even realize the fact that I'm first generation American on my mother's side. And conversations during my childhood about language and why does English do this? I never realized how much of an impact that would have on me. So I started this blog all about language use and this blog went viral. And it was a blog that was supposed to just be a joke with family and friends and people in my writing community here in central Virginia. But this blog suddenly was being used in university classrooms. This blog was getting buyout offers by major dot-com dictionaries. And all of a sudden I was saying, well, this was just a fun little side project while I was working on my fiction. Let's play with this a little bit. And I signed with a literary agent a week and a half after signing with a literary agent. I had a book deal for Get a Grip on Your Grammar that came out in 2017. Goodness, that book, um, I have, it's been such a joy to geek out over language. <laughs> Um, and I mean, HarperCollins India brought it to India. I mean, it's been an, a really fun journey and I've been playing with that. My two workbooks on novel editing because people talk a lot about how to write a novel but not how to edit one when it's, you have that rough draft. That one followed, followed by the family story workbook because so often we've always wanted to write our family history but didn't know where to start. And that's where this whole journey came full circle for me because since I was a small child, I heard family stories that amazed me and just were so profound in world history, but the history classes I went to never touched on the subject matter of the Ukrainian story during World War II. It danced all the way around it, but I've been hearing these stories since I can remember. Um, my house was not one that ever held back scary stories, especially personal stories, and my grandparents told me tales about horrible, horrible things to the Ukrainian intelligentsia who were murdered um, during this time period, and I waited for those stories, and I never found those stories. And you know what? I'm a storyteller. So you know what you do? You write the story if you can't find it. And that's where the Baba Yaga mask came from, the stories that I had been looking for my whole life, the stories I had been training for my whole life, you could say. And that's how this book came together. Okay. And as someone who also works with uh, with editing as a reporter and news editor, I'm right there with you. So I get the feeling you and I are, are going to have a lot to talk about when it comes to just the world of grammar, because likewise, right. I spent my whole life exploring grammar with like all the different word uses there and there through right. and through. And of course, in my case, the, the rules are, are always changing. So it's yes. staying up to date on like, okay, what, you know, how do, how do we do email? Do we put a hyphen in, in, in this word or not? And that's, that's a whole thing. It's ever changing. And people want to yell about it and get upset about it and talk about grammar, please. But no, you know what? We're all trying to do our best. And let's just help each other out. That's where Get a Grip on Your Grammar came from. It's it's playful. It's um, hopefully funny. I don't know. I, I think it's funny. <laughs> it's one of those things. I don't want it to be angry. And I don't want it to make you fall asleep. There's no grammar jargon. That's not the point of the conversation. I get you. But the thing is, if we didn't have grammar police, all these books would not look nearly as well. Alad. 
Valid. Yeah. So on social media, stop screaming about it. Um, but when it comes to publishing, when it comes to writing articles, when it comes to writing essays, if you're actually putting your work out in the world, don't be sloppy about it. We can do better than that. So that's where it's time to just step it up. And yes, that's where the fabulous writers and journalists and editors and proofreaders come in to take these profound ideas that sometimes are in our brains, but don't translate to the keyboard. Sometimes it's there, it just doesn't translate and they just need to be spit polished to a shine and it can be done. And it doesn't take AI, I promise you. <laughs> it's a whole other conversation. That's an entirely different episode, I think. But let's <laughs> but let's get back to you. So given your background and your experience and your skill set, one would think a novel would be easy. But I'm wondering when the time came to write this thing, did you have to get help? You know it? Yes. Um so this is not my first attempt at a novel. My first attempt at a novel is kind of back to the drawing board. A couple times I had written a middle grade piece a number of years ago that I, it went really far, but didn't actually end up landing anywhere. And I'd been playing with all sorts of different stories. But the difference between a novel and just writing scenes is, of course, you have to have that narrative drive that pulls the entire force forward. You are not just writing a collection of hilarious scenes or a collection of interesting scenes that actually has to be woven together in a way that works for both the reader and the character's emotional and physical journeys, depending on what the story may be. And of course, I figured I might as well make this a challenge for myself because the Baba Yaga mask is interwoven. We have the story of a grandmother in 1941 Ukraine, right as World War II is touching Ukrainian soil. And you have the story of two contemporary sisters, um, because in the contemporary thread, this grandmother has said she needs to see Ukrainian so dancing on soil where it makes sense before she dies. She books a flight, she flies to Europe, she steps off that plane, and she disappears. And you have her two granddaughters, one just under 30, one just over 30, in two very different stages of their lives, two very opposite characters, often at odds with each other, going off to find their grandmother. Is she lost? Is she hurt? Is she injured? Is, is she up to something? And she might just be up to something. So it is those two things. And as I'm weaving multiple point of views through multiple contemporary and historical plot lines, I gave myself a little bit of a challenge on that narrative structure. But oh my gosh, I had so much fun pulling it all together. And the writing craft takes practice. The first draft of anything is not perfect. No, even the people who you consider the greats, their first drafts didn't come out like that, I promise you. It takes work. And people sometimes forget how much editing is involved to really take something that is a great concept and push it over the finish line. So yes, I, I really enjoyed putting myself through the process that I do with my editing clients because it's it can be difficult, but putting myself through that exact same step by step, this is how you take the plot, this is how you take the characters, this is how you take every single sentence, every single verb to where it needs to be, putting myself through my own paces with the challenge, but I think it worked. Oh, definitely. I, I've actually, uh, I've actually uh, just started reading it, and I'm really loving the different characters. Actually, uh, the grandmother reminds me a lot of my own grandmother. You know, always Excellent. like telling stories, always with this really like rich history. Actually, my my grand my grandfather too, because he always had stories growing up. But I want to touch on the notion of the of the separate threads here. As you mentioned, you've got this look in the past and this look in the present. Why go in this direction, and how do you weave them together? All right, so I think this goes back to what I was saying that ever since I could remember, I was hearing these stories from my own grandmother and my own grandfather about the Ukrainian story of World War II and specifically the Western Ukrainian um, story of World War II. Until about a year plus ago, most people didn't know where Ukraine was on a map. This, it was not a, a place that was touched on historically culturally. And this is where I needed to bring it um, into the light. And I, it's one of those things that the timing of this book is surreal. And I am so honored to be able to tell stories to the world that the world needs to hear right now. But going back to the concept of threads, I tried my earlier versions of this as a purely historical I tried this as a YA. I tried this from a memoir point of view. The first publication I ever had in my life was actually poetry. 
um, on a similar subject matter. It's just been something that's been stuck in my head and I just could needed to find the right angle to approach it. And I tried so many times. And a while back, this concept hit me about a grandmother stepping off a plane and disappearing. And as soon as that concept struck, I suddenly had my angle because then I could tell the grandmother's story, but then I could also tell it from the point of view of a contemporary world, a contemporary American existence, very similar to my own that I could relate to. Because even when things are historical fiction, you need to get your stories right. Um, you need to get your facts right. Um, this is historical fiction, but I worked with academics across the globe to make sure I had the subtleties of not only language, but dance, of art, of symbolism, of tradition, correct. Um, I worked, yes, the University of Central Europe. Um, there were some people I was working with over there. I was working with academics across the United States. I was working with a lot of family and friends in my own Ukrainian community, um, just to make sure everything was correct. But bringing in the contemporary thread, let me access it from a worldview that I knew without a doubt. So then playing with these two uh, you could say two or three um, points of view because I go back and forth between the two sisters and the contemporary thread also. Um, it was a challenge, but it was a whole lot of fun. It was a puzzle to figure out how did they grow as characters in complex yet similar ways that I could parallel their stories. Where did they go through similar, uh, not to give any away any plot, but where did they go through similar heartbreaks? Where did they go through similar anticipation that I could parallel those structures, different eras, different characters, but in a way that hit an emotional note that I was looking for. And it was fun. Nice. I'm curious to, to see these other versions to, uh, that you had, like the historical version, the YA version. <laughs> right. I'm really, because I've always been told that the first draft and the final draft are never even remotely the same. Going with this version, though, how did you know that it was the right one? How do you know that, hey, this is the way, this is like the, fi uh, the final form here? Sometimes when a story bites mm. and it hits you, it goes whether you want it to or not. As a writer yourself, you probably know this, you know, experience this, no matter what it is, what genre, what form, what topic, something sometimes gets into the back of your head and it won't let you go. And this was one of those things that I had this concept of the grandmother stepping off the plane and disappearing. And all of a sudden, everything else just unfolded because um, I wanted to play with kind of three major pieces in this and everything I wanted to accomplish could be done with the structure. I wanted to tell the Ukrainian World War II story. I wanted to speak about the concept of how there's not a single definition of how a woman can be strong. Because you know what Vera, the grandmother, when we see her as a teenager in 1941, she is a rebel. She is feisty. When we see the two contemporary sisters, one who is a mom who is holding her world and her family's world and all of the meticulous pieces that go into that together, she's a powerhouse. And sometimes people don't acknowledge the powerhouses of motherhood and especially young motherhood. Um, and then you have Ira, the second sister. She's a younger sister. She's the free spirit. She's the one who follows her gut and ignores everything else. And you know what? There's something to be said for female intuition. There's something to be said by something that hits your heart and won't let you go. And I found ways I could relate to all three of these characters. And then they took me on their journey. All right. Let's talk about that journey because we've talked about it a little bit already. Uh, Vera, the grandmother on a transatlantic flight just goes missing. And now her two granddaughters have to find her, have to basically track her down. But one thing that uh, that kind of caught my eye was Vera is referred to as a woman who is always told more tales than, than truths. What does that mean and how does it factor into the story? I think you already touched on it a little bit with your own grandparents. Grandparents often has, have amazing stories. Sometimes we listen, sometimes we don't. Um, and Vera is someone who's told stories her whole life, not only her own stories, but her own fishtails, if you will, her own exaggerations of her own stories so that her granddaughters um, who were raised by her don't always know the line between what's true, what is an exaggeration. And especially when they're hearing war stories, did you really speak German and pretend to be a German citizen in this moment? Did you really do all of these things? But in the midst of all of her own personal stories, the accomplishments, the tragedies, and everything in between, 
She's also a woman who is obsessed with folk tales, specifically Slavic folk tales that she grew up with. She's obsessed with stories of Baba Yaga, this Eastern European witch that American readers may or may not know. Um, she pops up in uh, pop culture all the time recently. She's everywhere from goodness, from John Wick to Puss in Boots to uh, Hellboy comics. To, I mean, she's everywhere lately, but whether you know her or not, She's this Eastern European witch that is so much more than a evil Disney caricature of a witch. She's complex. She's evil sometimes. But if you get on her good side, if you prove yourself to her, if you show her that you're brave, if you show her that you have a moral compass, if you show her that you're hardworking, she's almost a magic fairy godmother creature, a creature, very uh, fairy godmother character at times. And with this complexity, I love this idea of the underestimated old woman and playing with a grandmother against this trope of this story. The grandmother has been obsessed with her whole life. This is not a fantasy book. Baba Yaga is not a character in this book, but her stories are interlinked with the sisters along this journey. And her stories are something the grandmother has been obsessed with her whole life. And it's really fun. Folklore across world culture has fascinated me forever. Um, so interweaving those pieces amidst all of the Ukrainian tradition history was a really fun piece. Any particular folklores that really stick out to you? There are any kind of favorites for you? Um, well, I will have to say that I'm completely obsessed with Baba Yaga. Um, it's actually funny. I'm continuing on my Baba Yaga journey that my next book, um, I actually just have a new book deal that was recently signed that is going back to nonfiction. And it is exploring the depths of Baba Yaga and how she collides with modern life, how she is that epitome of both horror and hope at once in a world that seems sometimes scary and you don't know what to do with it. And if that doesn't sound like the modern day, I don't know what does. Um, yeah, so I'm continuing with Baba Yaga for a little while here, playing with Slavic folklore and looking into how its roots go back millennia, which is absolutely fascinating to me. And yes, the new book is called Becoming Baba Yaga. It is nonfiction and it is coming from Red Wheel Wiser Press in the fall of 2024. <laughs> You are very on top of this, I gotta say. Like you, like you, you really know everything to cover. You know the publisher, the date, all this stuff. Um, I'm trying. Yeah, no. I want to ask about that though. Of course, like the business side of being a writer, especially now, you've right. got to be your own everything, or you got to be your own, you know, oh marketer gosh. and your own publicity person a lot of the times. How did you adapt to that change, especially as your books kind of took off? Right. Um, I think all of us as writers have this idea that we can sit in our offices, our home offices, find that coffee shop, and we can just think our wise thoughts and tell our captivating tales, and the world will see our brilliance, and they will come, and the money will roll in. I think somewhere there's this concept of that. It's not quite how the writer's life actually works, though. Um, so as we find kind of our ways of the storytelling life, um, I have been an editor and a wordsmith for however many years, um, decade plus of helping people empower their own stories. And I've been playing with it in the publishing world, obviously in the corporate world, world storytelling is everywhere. Every single person on earth is a storyteller. And I think sometimes we forget that. Every single person on earth is a writer and it's kind of this secret of humanity, of this hidden talent that is sometimes not acknowledged. I love playing with that. But in the midst of all of this, um, I was a college professor, writing professor for a number of years, um, doing, doing that on the side. But it's one of those things that I have never had an issue getting up in front of an audience and speaking. I Again, the college professor piece of me comes into this there are ways as writers we need to find our ways to help our own cause. Um, we don't have a Baba Yaga who we can prove ourselves to, who will make all of our dreams come true, unfortunately, although I'm still hunting for her. Um, so yes, we just have to find our ways. And there are countless ways for writers to step into the publicity and marketing world. You can't do all the things. You cannot go viral on every social media thing and be a world-class speaker across the globe and um, publish a gazillion guest articles and be on every podcast you want to be on. It's impossible. There's only so much we can do. 
So find what parts of the marketing world align with your talents and your skill sets. Find where you're comfortable. If you're not someone who loves being in front of a crowd, okay, so that does not have to be your thing. There's a difference um, between all of the things and then just being really good at what you know you're really good at. And there are lots of possibilities out there. So I've explored for a long time. Still working on it. Ah, but I think you got it. I think you got it. Um, all right. Back to the book, because I want to talk a little more about Vera, Larissa, and Ira. Three characters. But I know this book is, is of course, partially based on your own family, your own, your own experiences. How, mu- how real are these three characters? They are completely made up. They're not based on any individual um, exactly. Um, I want to say this book is very much inspired by world events. Not necessarily my family history. None of the things that happen to these women are pieces out of my own family history. Um, with the exception of Vera as a teenager stuffing a frog down her brother's shirt. That was like a two-sentence insertion, which was a little throwdown um tribute to my own grandmother who once did that thing um but like there's like a little thing that i think a couple little places where any writer sticks their own personal easter eggs that they're not gonna well i guess now i'm telling the world but um but their own little things that their family will get or their friends will get but it's not really a this is a big thing so there's a couple little nuggets like that but the world events shape the book, not the characters um, based off of any specific family members or any specific relatives or friends or people who I know in passing. No, but I'm not a writer who borrows from specific people. But that being said, I like borrowing emotional truths. So I think at different points in your life, as you think about who you are in this moment versus who you are five years ago versus who you are two decades ago, You can kind of think about how, you know what, when you were in this era of your life, something was more important to you than it is today. And when you were in a different era of your life, you kind of had different feelings. Sometimes we have singular moments in our life where like, wow, I acted incredibly out of character that day. So sometimes I don't look for comparisons of people who I know, but I look for emotional truths that I have experienced and lean into those. Because sometimes when you lean into emotional truths, you can find some depth, depths and explorations of characters that make them more than just flat mother, more than just flat free spirit. These people are complex. People are complex. The way we live our lives, the way we sit here having this conversation, we're sitting in different ways. We behave body language. Everything is different between every individual person. I work on this with so many storytellers, but I had to work on this myself too. Um, So yeah, I look for emotional depth and playing deeper with that. Hmm. All right, then I want to ask a bit about the history because this book, the the past portion, is set in post World War II Ukraine. Certainly parallels to what we are are seeing now. But as someone who has really studied this extensively, how do these two line up? What's fascinating and heartbreaking to me about this whole situation is that this 1941 plot line before World War II. This um, Russia had taken um, all the way past Western Ukraine and had um, kind of in, taken over that territory. Um, in the moment of this book, which is the spring of 1941 through um, pretty much the fall of 1941 is the main events of the book. It goes a little bit past that, but those are the main events of the book. You have this moment of history where Ukraine is occupied. Um, Ukraine has been, if you look in the past hundreds of years in Ukraine, Ukraine is often occupied. It's often fighting for its own independence. It's often fighting for the world to admit that it has its own culture. It has its own values. It has its own language. Um, so in this moment, um, Nazi Germany has already taken over Poland. Russia has extended all the way across Western Ukraine and invaded that moment. And in this moment of the book, you have this independence movement happening in Western Ukraine in a little region called Galicia. And they're trying to figure out, can we be independent? Or there's the Germans over here who say that they're going to help us kick out Russia. And the Germans are saying that they're going to help us be independent. So just imagine from a historical context and what you know about Germany during World War II and how honest you think they might be when they are promising Ukraine, hey, sure, yes, we'll help you be independent and kick out Russia. What's gonna happen next? 
But for the people who are living in that moment, who are living in Russian occupied Ukraine, the last time foreign forces occupied Ukraine, about 80 years ago, this is the last time foreign for forces occupied Ukraine. Of course, after World War II, we went with the Soviet Union through. Um, and so there's a different level of occupation that can be discussed there. But in this last major foreign invasion, you have this moment in history where all of these people are torn in Western Ukraine, where my novel is set. We're scared of the Soviet force that is there. They are killing people. They are imposing their language. They are doing all of this stuff. On the other side, we see what's happening to the Polish people, and that's horrific. On the other side, Germany is promising Ukraine to help them be independent. And then people are saying, well, maybe we can just be by ourselves and independent without anybody else's help. So this struggle for independence, for understanding your own nationality, for having this understanding of the motherland and what that means to you and willing to fight to the death, to stand up for that. The parallels to the present day are surreal. Um, as you said, this book is out in paperback and audiobook. Um, the audiobook just came out um, this month. The paperback came out last year, five weeks after Russia invaded Ukraine. There was a moment that no writer ever wants to experience on multiple levels, but there was a moment I called my publisher and I said, I can't do this. I can't wiggle my fingers and say, jazz hands, buy my book. That's not how I can move forward with this. I need to process this. I need to figure out how to even discuss this because a war has just broken out that parallels the exact experience of my book in 1941. How do I talk about this? And my publisher, my dear publisher, they're like, um, okay, <laughs> what do you do with that when the writer says, stop the presses? I didn't say stop the presses. I just said, give me a week to process. Um, and during that week, I surrounded myself with Ukrainians and tried to figure this out. And the one thing that hit me is, who am I not to tell the story? I know this history, I know this culture, I know these traditions and the art and the music and the dancing. The world needs to understand Ukrainian identity and Ukrainian history, now perhaps more than ever. And I'm someone who can tell that story. So this is not necessarily jazz hands by my debut novel. I mean, it is that, I mean, what writer would not have that? However, in the past year, I've been able to have humanitarian aid efforts, collecting donations with every single book club I have met with. I have worked with libraries on fundraisers. I have looked with, worked with bookstores on fundraisers. I've worked with um, international nonprofits to pull together speaking events with uh, Ukrainian Easter egg artists and Ukrainian dancers and embroidery specialists across the country to come together to speak about Ukrainian culture, to illuminate these stories, and yes, to talk about my book. But the past year has made this so much bigger than my book. And I've been honored to make that cause. For anybody listening, I am still doing a lot of book club work, a lot of donation work. Go to my website, um, chrisbizak.com. You'll see all the details right there. If you can't uh, spell my name, um, it's K-R-I-S um, hyphen Spizak, S-P-I-S-A-K.com. Um, and you'll see all details about my books, my ongoing fundraisers. It's been over a year, but we are continuing to send everything from diapers to first aid kits. We did a big winter sock collection. There are a lot of people who need help, who don't have electricity, who are living with the reality of war every single day. And it's great to read a book and read a book, buy my book. But at the same time, let's learn about each other. This is not the only story that the world needs to pay attention to right now but it's a story that we do need to pay attention to right now. So educate yourself, help the cause if you can. Agreed. Fully agreed. And uh, we'll also be adding the link to her website in the description for the episode. So folks, if you, if you, you. didn't write this down, it's there. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, given the close connection you have both in your family and your history, I'm curious, did you have a hard time saying, okay, this is done? Or was, was there a constant review to make sure you get every single detail correct? Um, there was the constant review to get every single detail correct. There 
like so many revisions where I felt like it was done, but I'm like, you know what? I need one more Ukrainian reader or, you know what? I think it was done, but you know what? Let me go find a specialist in Ukrainian dance to make sure where the way I describe this music is actually authentic. And when you're writing a novel, how many specialists can you find before you say that, okay, I'm good, it's done. But I tried to be as true to my story as possible. Um, I think in the end, between the history, the art, the music, all of the pieces that I play with in here, um, I know there was one detail that I fudged. Here's my secret. Um, sunflowers are not full height in May. <laughs> I know. I compl- This is the fiction part of the story, right? Um, again, it's one of those things. I try to be as historically authentic as all the things. I fudged the height of the sunflowers in May. I had somebody call me out on this the other day, too, and I'm like, I know. It's true. Sunflowers in Ukraine are not at their full height in May, but it fit the timeline of my story for the scene that I wanted to write. That was a historical fudge. I apologize. But you take and you leave. But I think that's the only thing that I knowingly budged. I'm sure there's other pieces that might be imperfect because, again, my family's Ukrainian experience is not every Ukrainian experience. Just like you talk about any culture, I will completely acknowledge that the folk art, the symbolism, the dance, all of these things are regional. And someone who has family connections in different places might have a completely different experience. Um, the Ukrainian language in the book is very much old Ukrainian. It's 1940s Ukrainian that was taken when my family left. There's modern Ukrainian that's not in there, but that's not true to my story because that's not the character's history, too. Well, I, for one, am just shocked and appalled that you fudge the facts about sunflowers <laughs> in May. How dare you? How dare? <laughs> I know. Dare? It's terrible. <laughs> I know. It's funny the things people get mad about. <laughs> I, and I'm surprised someone actually caught that, too. Of yeah. all the things to catch, is like they someone someone actually knows that much about uh, about sunflowers and how they grow that they're able to say, nope, that's totally wrong. No, it was it was funny. There was like a gardening person, somebody who was really into gardening, who was at a library talk, and she was talking about different things about flowers that I because also in Ukrainian dancing and costumes, often you have a flowered headdress that is going with ribbons and all sorts of things. And I was talking about one of those, and she's like, you know. I'm not sure the way you talk about those flowers, those would be in full bloom yet. I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, you know what? You're right. You're absolutely right. But you know what? Some tiny things, I will say this is fiction. And I, there were a couple little things, but that's okay. <laughs> That that is that is just too funny that of all that this person just happened to be there when you were doing the talk and they said, like, you know what? That's not actually accurate. It's like, rats, they saw through me. Yep, it's true. And then I've had other people here like, you know what, let me see if I can stump you on your Ukrainian history. Let's start dropping all these names in the historical. But it kind of goes back to the grammar conversation. We're not here to tear each other apart. Hmm. We're here to help the cause and to educate each other. And if you want to talk about Ukrainian history, I promise you, I can talk a lot about Ukrainian history. Um, if you're trying for one of those gotcha moments, you know what, do I know everything that is possible? No, nobody does. But um, I can speak intelligently about Ukrainian history. I promise. <laughs> I wish I had that kind of time to, you know, skim to like scan the book and like have and like find those gotcha moments. So if that person has that kind of time on your hands, more power to you. Um, Let's talk a bit more about about the history. Did this really change the original plan for the book as you learned more and more and talked to the experts? It did. It did. And it's one of those things that we all have our family stories, the stories we hear from grandparents, the stories we hear from family friends. And in the beginning, it was a little bit of a balancing act of, where are the tall tales? Where are the exaggerations? Where does world history meet my family stories? Um, you, you said my third book, my third story, my third book oh, it's over here is called The Family Story Workbook. That book came to be because I was doing so much meticulous research within my own family history was loving every single second of it because how often do we say that we want to write our life story? How often do we say we want to write down all the stories of all of our relatives, yet we don't know where to start? That's where the family story workbook came from. It is the starting point to let absolutely anybody write that history. Um, So again, it went back to, I just tried to interview as many people as possible, especially in the World War II generation. There are not many people in the Ukrainian community where I am very connected, who are left in that community, who are of sound mind and spirit to be able to speak on it. My grandparents who told their stories are not with us anymore. Um, But going through old 
letters going through um, family stories from the next generation and what they were told and their versions of the story where again, it's like, oh, but wait, we're getting a generation removed. How accurate is this? And so we're talking about different things. I had a couple moments where I was speaking with academics across the country who are Ukrainian and they had connections in similar places and cities in 1940s. And all of a sudden we were sitting there saying, there's a really good chance that our grandparents knew each other in the 1940s. And it was just very funny that this happened more than once that from across the world, I was finding people who I had possible connections with. There was someone who I found that um, she is a Ukrainian artist and teaches Ukrainian art in North Carolina, but we just were chatting about things and we realized that, you know what? We both had grandparents who lived in this one city in Florida. And in the 1980s, we both used to spend summer vacations with our grandparents in Florida. And we realized we had this Ukrainian church in common. And like, you know what? In the 1980s, we might have hung out. And now, however many decades later, we find each other again and speak on this. It's it's fascinating. All right. Uh, let's talk about the audiobook because I'm a huge audiobook fan. I love listening to them. I probably have like 100, almost like 200 titles actually on um, on in my account. How does this change the book? Because I know that the print and the audio can be can add a whole new dimension, really. Right. Um, it's fascinating because the narrator does so many things. I think Allison did a tremendous job on the narration of this book. She brings it to life so beautifully. Um, I remember in the very early days when we were going through this, um, this book went to... Um, there was a bidding war for the audio of the book. And one of the stipulations in the contract was that I got to choose the final narrator. They would narrow it down to three. And then I would get to choose the final narrator, which at first I was thinking, this is an awesome negotiation point. How cool is that? But then when you get down to it and you're listening to these people audition your book and you're listening to this and you're like, how on earth am I going to have the pressure of choosing this? I'm like, I will never ever negotiate that ever again because it was high pressure. But I think um, Allison did an amazing job on this audiobook. It's a different experience. It is old radio drama versus a reading experience. Audio, I love audiobooks. I do the same thing. I have so many audiobooks that I listen to because it's a different experience, but it's a little bit more accessible sometimes in our daily lives than having the time to sit still and read a book. Um, but it's funny. She, she had kind of some different takes on things. Anytime you have someone else read your thing, sometimes she read a line different from how I would read a line and different pieces kind of shifted a little bit, but I'm like, you know what? That's a different perspective on it. And rather than, I guess, saying, oh, no, that's wrong. I just tried to listen to it of like, well, what was her take? Because just like anything else, a reader takes a writer's work and it's the reader's experience at that point. And it was a similar thing with the audiobook that the audiobook narrator took my work and made it a completely different experience. And I, I'm very happy with how it turned out. It was very neat. I definitely understand that because there are some books that just, not that they can't be made into audiobooks, but it is more of a challenge than others. Like there's some that are written really because they know an audiobook is going to come out. And there are right. some where it's like, okay, Clearly, this was not in your mindset at all. You weren't even thinking yes. about that. And so when you try to read it, it's like, I think we got to do some changes. And it, I, I think it's good that you gave Allison the freedom to, you know, mess around a little bit and maybe make some like small tweaks to, to, so that it could flow better when you're when you're listening to it. Right, exactly. Yeah. And every single word is the same, but her treatment of it, it, it was very cool to see it all come to life. Excellent. Excellent. All right. All right. Well, Chris, we are nearing the end of this conversation, uh, but I do want to wrap up by asking you about uh, Larissa and Ira's journey. Without being too spoilery, what else do they discover as they make this journey? As I said earlier, one of my major goals with this book was not only to expose the world to Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian history, but it was to expose the world to the many different facets of a strong woman, that there's not just one definition of a strong woman. And through these three characters, um, they all are powerhouses in their own right. And all of them, I'll actually, I'll take Vera out of this conversation because her story is so very different. But in the process of searching for their lost grandmother, both of them go on a journey of finding themselves, of recognizing their own abilities, talents, strengths, and also the recognition of the power of each other. 
the growth of these sisters who may not always get along. I mean, think about that with your own family. Sometimes the people who are we closest to are the ones that irk us the most. Sometimes the people who we know so well, we don't always see how capable they are. And that's how, especially in the beginning, these two sisters are. They both bother each other so much because Larissa is so very meticulous and organized and Ira is so very unorganized and doesn't have a plan for anything, but it'll all work out. She's very optimistic. Um, and how these characters come to discover their own hidden secrets and their own hidden strengths, but also recognizing the strengths of each other. Oftentimes there are so many debates on the right way to be strong and there is no right way to be strong. And we all have different levels of strengths and how do we tap into that? And then how do we acknowledge that in each other? And both of those two sisters are very much on that journey. I don't think I gave away any spoilers. <laughs> exactly. Key, key thing. It's a key thing. All right. Well, Chris, it has been wonderful talking with you. Uh, I'm very much enjoying the book and cannot wait to read the rest of it. And I think I'll be getting the audio book too. But for the folks at home, if you want to learn more, you go to chrisspizak.com. That's K-R-I-S hyphen spisak.com it's all there you can get copies of her other books if you're looking to improve your writing abilities these are books to look at and of course check out the baba yaga mask and much more to come chris thank you again it's been great talking to you thank you so much for having me hi this is singer kate eppers and you're listening to citywide blackout and my next guest well at only 14 he and his brother have published six books all about the environment and the animals that call it home. But these are not just meant to entertain, they're meant to also educate the role of the animals, the threats facing the environment, and what we as people can do about it. Author and environmental activist Daniel Kim joins me. Daniel, welcome to the show. It's great to be talking with you. You flatter me too much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I am just beginning. I am just starting. Um, but let us, let us begin by just diving right into the news that one of your books, now, now your books have been out for a while in Korea, but they're now getting their big U.S. release with your book, The Whale Who Refused to Poo. I get to say that on this show. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's coming out on June 8th. But um, tell us just what this book is all about. Honestly, since most of our books are targeted towards uh, children, like maybe my age, maybe actually quite younger because my brother is my younger brother, my baby brother. So these books are directed towards children, uh, quite, quite young. So we wanted this book to kind of be humorous and kind of appeal towards these people per se. So it's about this whale who, as the title says, refused to poo. He gets a little embarrassed. <laughs> He's a little embarrassed to poo in front of everyone. And it, this journey is kind of about him learning what he is, uh, like what role he plays in the environment. Uh, as you know, in real life, whales play a very substantial role in what they do. They're actually a keystone species, which basically means they're very pivotal to the entire, entire environment. And one of their main roles is actually humorously pooping. Also, before I continue, folks, do not Google whales pooping, all right? just save yourself that all right um but um now in, in terms of the writing process for this book uh why go in this direction why focus on on this particular topic i think that my goal personally is to spread awareness as much as i can about the environment kind of do as much as i can as a 14 year old and do it in ways that people will find entertaining and i decided to go in this direction of the book to kind of keep people entertained it's a lot easier to listen to basically what I have to say if it's kind of put in this more humorous format, you know? I see. So when you uh, began writing, did you try to go for a more serious approach or were you always about the entertainment and educate combination? I think when I first started writing, uh, we tried to go for a more serious approach, or at least I did, because I really didn't know what exactly what I was going to do because I started when I was very, very young, little child. And I'm like, hey, I want to write books. I want to spread my message to the world, but what can I do? And all the books I read were more serious or the books I read or the books my mom gave me were more serious. So based on all that, we tried to go for a more serious approach. And I realized giving feedback from my friends and my brother that maybe that wasn't working very well. So we just had to go for a more humorous approach. And I feel like it worked really well with the whale book. 
I agree because I think sometimes their books get either too like technical or they're too like doom and gloom. So it's good to try to find a bit of a, a mixed message that kind of appeals to the wider audience. Um, now, this one though was this one your first book? No, it was not. It was uh, one of our later books, actually. Oh, okay. Our first book was the Turtle Book, where it was just about a turtle who was kind of exploring the world. Oh, cool, cool. What got you into writing these books in the first place? Well, since I was very, very young, I always loved art and loved the environment. So we just combined that and it's like, hey, let's write a book about it. And my books aren't books per se, where it's just all words. It's mostly pictures. It's like a picture book. And I feel like I can express my artistic love and my love for the environment at the same time. You make it sound so easy. Honestly, you have, it's easy when you're having fun. And... Of course, when you have a brother that supports you all the way. Shout out to my brother. Love him. He's, he's so instrumental in everything. Oh, yeah. So is it, uh, is it uh, one of you does like one part of the book and the other one does the other? Um, I usually try and write the books, kind of write the narrative for the books. And when it comes down to it, my brother and I both start working on the painting and drawing. Wow. Very cool. Are you both uh, self-taught? Uh, no, we had an art teacher when we were younger, but nowadays we mostly draw ourselves, draw our own things. That is really cool. Very cool. Because I, I've seen some of the art and it's very, very impressive. Uh, did it take you a while to kind of find a sort of style that worked for the both of you? It took some, it took some getting used to kind of mixing our both, our styles together because we both have relatively different ways of drawing. Um, but in the end, I think we found a good approach. It took some time to say the least. I'll bet. Hey, it, it, it always takes time to get to a certain point. Uh, with that in mind, um, how would you say the writing has kind of evolved over the course of the six books? First, when I first started writing this thing, I don't, th- I, I, in hindsight, I didn't take it, take the narrative into as much depth as I would have liked. I blame that on my age and my naivete, but. Um, nowadays I try to be a little more, what is it called? What's the word for it? I'm blanking on the word, trying to put more depth into depth of character into the words. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, I can tell a story and talk about the environment at the same time. All right. All right. Um, what are some of the other stories that your books have explored? I th- one of our, uh, most recent. Or uh, obviously, I talked about the first book, the turtle book, that involves a hundred-year-old turtle kind of exploring the world, kind of seeing relatively groundbreaking experiences every single year. And in the end, he he experiences pollution of the ocean, kind of threats towards the sea, and he kind of sees that and and all, gets almost killed by it. Actually, a little dark for the first story, but he gets relatively gravely injured by all all this pollution and it's kind of a narrative that shows out of everything we've done over the years impressive beautiful tragic sad this is pollution and uh environmental destruction is probably one of the biggest things that that's basically going to destroy the world or has the potential to destroy the world how do you balance these two aspects of the stories you know entertainment with education i don't think there needs to be a some kind of balance you see obviously there shouldn't be much jokes laughter when the character or the situation is super dire but um i think education can come with entertainment and entertainment can come with education like i i really enjoy learning about these things and i think it's very entertaining to learn about these things and to throw in some jokes there when it's not that uh serious i feel like can help the mood and tone a little bit as well okay you mentioned enjoying the learning process, and I know that, of course, for any writer, research is like a months-long process before they say, oh, actually, I should actually write something down now. What kind of research goes into your books? Um, I, I have some general knowledge about this subject, or I would like to think so. Our school focuses a lot on um, in the environment and biology as well. I take multiple biology classes in my school, actually. And using this kind of background or general information, I can kind of get an idea on what animals, what kind of uh, experience I want to write about for this specific book. And I can 
uh, elaborate more on it by going into depth about it, kind of reaching out to some specialists, maybe reading articles already published on this animal and whatever trouble they're in at the moment. All right. When do you feel like, okay, I've got enough here. I'm ready to roll. Let's get to writing. It always feels like you don't have enough. It always feels like you need a little bit more. It's, it's some process, but sometimes my brother really helps me with this. My brother's like, Daniel, you've got enough. <laughs> Too much, actually. And, I'm like, Thank you. And, I just, and we just go pen to paper and start writing. If we need any more information, we can obviously research later. Kind of putting that pen to paper is the most helpful step, I think. There always has to be that that person to say, you know what, it's time to do this, or it's time to stop doing this and get this thing out there. I'm curious if you're the kind of person who has a hard time saying, okay, it's good enough. Okay. I am I feel very fortunate and very happy that I was born into a place where the dude that I live with actually helps me with that. Even in my school, even my school activities, the essays that I do, I get, I revise it like 13, 15, 40 times because I'm like, oh, it can be a little bit better. What happens if I change this one thing? I mean, I can add a little bit of information. And all my teachers are always like, I assigned you a hundred word uh, thing. Why did you write like a thousand words? <laughs> and <laughs> I'm like, obviously I'm exaggerating. The, the assignments are actually pretty long. They're like 500 words, but I go way over the word limit. And it's, it's kind of, I, I just have a hard time stopping with that. And I'm just fortunate that my brother's there to help me. Oh, nice, nice. Is there a really good back and forth between the, between the two of you during the creation process? Every step of the way, even even though I do the writing of the story, I think Benjamin really is there to help me. Uh, he revised my work. He's like, maybe this doesn't work. Maybe this works. Or how about trying this? It's really helpful for me that he says all of these things. And uh, yeah, he's very involved in the creative process and we wouldn't be here without him. Or I wouldn't be here without him. <laughs> All right, so as I mentioned earlier, your books are right around the corner from their U.S. debut with A Whale Who Refused to Poo. How are you feeling knowing that you're turning this this corner and getting out there before a much bigger audience? Honestly, a little nervous, but mostly excited. Kind of a generic answer, but honest, I don't really know what else I can say. It's generic for a reason. I'm sure many people feel like it. Oh, yeah, I, I, I would probably be the same thing. I'd be like, you know, yes, it's finally happening at the same time. Oh, boy, here we go. Yeah, it's like, ooh, what happens if they don't like it? Oh, what happens if they get it poorly? But like, I I like my work personally. I'm very, I'm in passion for it, and I'm very happy that it's getting out there. So it's mostly general positive feelings and a little bit of like, ooh, but mostly positive. Oh, ab- absolutely, absolutely. So. I want to ask about the other side of the books. Of course, this is uh, you and your brother's activism. Uh, how did this start, and why is it such an important cause for the two of you? Honestly, when I was really young, I went to the San Diego Zoo. I saw a bunch of animals there. I always loved animals, so I, I was obviously excited to go, and my parents took me. And I was really excited to see everything. saw every every attraction imaginable there. My parents kind of were kind of annoyed by it, but I did direct them out to everything we could go to. And while I don't remember most of the trip, I remember a specific animal, the white rhino that was uh, was there, and they were talking about it. I was like, "Oh my god, what? It's 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 a beautiful creature. It's so it's kind of honest. When I was younger, I thought it was kind of scary." <laughs> but still very, very cool at the same time. Like, what is this? And they were talking about how it was about to die off. My little, and they were about to go extinct. My little mind, my childhood um, emotions were like, oh my God, how do I save this thing? What? It's such a cool animal. Why is it going to die out? What, what is it dying from? And the more I looked into it, the more I asked my parents and my family and my teachers, I was like, I was shocked that all of this was happening. And that's kind of where the spark that kind of ignited this flame came from. I was like, what can I do to solve this? Um, obviously, I obviously I try to do more as I grow older, but the only thing my young mind thought of at the time was maybe I can kind of put something out there in the world, get everyone to know about it. I didn't know about it. 
how, my classmates didn't know about it. How do I tell them? How do I tell more people that this is happening? So basically we can stop, we can stop it. And I think this is especially important for your generation because you're coming into this really kind of taking on the burden of defending the world that unfortunately we have not done a very good job taking care of. Your classmates, your friends, do they have a similar attitude like we have to do something? I think I'm standing here with a smile on my face, kind of hopeful for the future because my classmates have a similar mindset and like similar motivation to kind of uh, protect this. If it was only me and my classmates, my brother didn't really care about this, I think I wouldn't even be here. I don't think I'd even have like the passion to write these books. Seeing their motivation after learning about this empowers me, kind of ignite, kind of impassions me to write these books. I know that if even one person no finds finds uh, their passion for saving the environment from my books, it's successful. And my classmates, uh, they found their passion for the environment. And I'm very happy about that. Okay. Um, what's your feeling on just how things are now? Uh, what kind of just you see stuff in the news, you see what's kind of happening in the world. How do you how do you feel about that? <laughs> Broad question there. Uh, it's, what do I feel about what's happening in the world right now? Mixed emotions, really. Mm-hmm. For every every time I open the news, it feels like something drastic is happening. Not just in the animal world; it's in in general life as well. Like we just got out of the COVID pandemic. Or most, a lot of people are still in the COVID pandemic, actually. And a lot of people are still suffering from it. And I see the numbers go up, down, up, down. They're like dire straits. I see animal, animals going extinct every day as well. Animals being put on endangered, endangered lists, extinct lists, in extinct lists. But every now and then, uh, I get a notification on my email that kind of tells me this little success that happened in the animal kingdom. This little habitat that we managed to protect, this one animal that we seemingly found that wasn't actually extinct, that we thought was extinct, but still has chances of it to come back again. We found a new species of it. And that just kind of gives me a little bit of hope each time. Obviously, probably mostly negative, but that those one things kind of brighten my day whenever it happens. I like that, yeah. The small victories. You gotta take like take take the other uh, small wins too, because it can't can't be focused on on like the overall problems. Gotta be like, what little things are we seeing here that is actually getting better? I'm curious if there are any fellow activists who you look up to as either an inspiration or an influence. Honestly, as a as a child, I tend to, I tend to look up to other children, especially Greta Thunberg, in my opinion. I think what she's doing is amazing. And what she started when she was similar to my age, kind of like a teenager, like a very young teenager. And whenever I see those things, I kind of, I'm like, oh my God, but she's the same age or similar age I am. And she's out there making such a big difference. I know if I work hard enough, I can maybe, maybe make a difference as well. And she's someone I look up to quite a bit. When it comes to making a difference, what are you hoping to accomplish through the books? I th- I try to make a small difference every day in my life, like recycling properly, not littering, kind of uh, what doing what I can, small things every now and again, or every time I can. But with these books, I'm trying to kind of advocate to everyone as well. What I, if even if I recycle one possible, even if I I'm, in the end of at the end of the day, I'm just one person. And I'm just one child. But with these, but if I can get the word out there and if I get a lot of people to also to be doing what I am or also care enough about what I care about, a group of people can make a change. If everyone starts littering, no, sorry, not littering. If everyone starts recycling, uh, big things can happen. If everyone cares about this and if everyone works hard to kind of create laws, strive to do try to make the world a better place, the world can actually become a better place for all of us. Okay. I want to ask about what is in the future for the two of you. Is there going to be a book seven? Definitely. 
I I'm hundred percent sure we're gonna continue doing this or in or in the foreseeable future, I'm sure we're gonna be doing this. And I don't plan on stopping until the climate until everything is better, which is probably gonna be some time, but hey, you can you can look out for book seven when it comes out. Exactly, exactly. Uh, can you give us any hints as what as what book seven might be about? I don't think so. This is gonna be a secret for now. Ah, oh, you kill man. Come on. All right, I get you. I get you though. You want to keep us in suspense. I get that. Um, how about once these books start start getting the U.S. release? Do you plan to work with any U.S. organizations or any other activists? I would love to actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we haven't quite thought about it completely yet with my brother but after the books come out i feel like maybe for our next books probably not book seven immediately but for subsequent books reaching out to fellow activists even my classmates um to kind of work together on this would be a wonderful idea and be a great opportunity for all of us all right um all right daniel as we bring this thing to a close it may seem like a silly question but i am curious favorite animal do you have one Favorite animal. Of course I have one. And I I have to go with the penguin. Really? Okay. Why is that? I think, I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a stupid thing. But it's, it's a very incon- inconsequential thing. But I think it, they look really cute. Really cute animals. Really unique animals as well. Unlike anything other. It's like a scaly mammal that kind of rolls up into a ball as well. It's like an armadillo. But a lot cuter in my opinion. <laughs> I just think they're neat. Uh, hey, I like it, man. I like it, man. It's a great answer. I'm curious one more, th- uh, one more thing before we go. Do you think a lot about your role in, in all this in terms of like the task you've taken on and what you're hoping to accomplish? <sighs> so I think what I'm, uh, I try not to think about it as much because it brings me down into a rabbit hole. Like, what, how much impact am I really making or mm-hmm. what am I doing? But I think uh, whatever I can do, whatever I'm doing now, and whatever difference it causes is is enough for me. As I've said, even if my book only changes one person out there to kind of care more about the environment and look into this as a potential, what is it, a hobby of theirs, a potential passion of theirs, I think I did my job. Okay. All right, I want to close this out with a hypothetical situation. Someone has just, has just bought one of your books, and they walk up to you and say, what do I do? I want to help out. What do I do? How do you guide them? I think I would always advise them, do the little things. Like I, I do it all the time. It may feel like nothing. It may feel like one plastic bottle on the ground. But picking them, picking them away, that's a, that's a pretty big thing you can do. Everyone does that. I think it, the streets would be cleaner. Everything would be nicer. Okay. Everything would be more wonderful. Not just a little bit. If you can, talk about it. And I'm going to imagine the person that's coming up to me is a fellow child. And I'll, I'll advise them kind of talk about it in school, kind of talk, uh, advocate it to more people. If, if I talk to, if I, if I uh, what is it, spread my passion to two people and they spread out to two more people, they spread out to two more people. Then everyone can have, everyone can share this passion. We can make a big impact in our world. Excellent. All right. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And as a quick reminder, folks, uh, the book "The Whale Who Refused to Poo" out on June eighth. Wonderful for kids, but also a great message about about what we need to do to make things better for our world. And if you want to learn more, you uh, you go to commonplanet.org. You'll uh, you'll find information about all the books. And Daniel, thanks again, and looking forward to the next book. Thank you so much for inviting me. And that brings this episode to a close. Thanks to everyone for listening. And be sure to follow the show on Facebook at Citywide Blackout and Twitter and Instagram at Citywide Max. You can reach me at citywidemax at yahoo.com to suggest a guest or submit music for the Blackout Collection playlist. You can find the show wherever you check out your favorite podcasts. And new episodes are aired every Saturday at 10 p.m. EST on Boston Free Radio. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.